There seems to be a new Ender 3 printer from Creality every other week, but the latest offering has more features than any before it. Does this make the Ender 3 S1 Pro the best Ender 3 you can buy? In this video, I'm going to find out. Now, along with the highest spec they've ever given an Ender 3, the S1 Pro also comes with one of the highest price tags too. Luckily for you, Geek Buy Never Gain offered us a big discount if you order via the links and using the code in the description. The discount is good if you're in the US or Europe, but if you're in the UK, the discount is particularly nice. The biggest discounts only last for August 22, so don't wait too long if you want to take advantage of this great deal. Geek Buying supplied this printer for testing, but I'm under no obligation to give it a great review if it doesn't deserve one. So what are the standout features of the S1 Pro that Creality are hoping will tempt you to part with an extra $300 over a base level Ender 3? The S1 Pro has a direct drive extruder. It has an all metal hot end that allows printing temperatures of up to 300 degrees, a touch screen display, dual lead screws, a PEI magnetic bed, along with the option of adding a laser engraving head for an extra $70. There are also many less noticeable differences compared to the original Ender 3, but these have appeared over the various Ender models that have evolved in the four years since the first model went on sale. The only real consistent feature through the whole Ender 3 range is the print volume. As with its predecessors, the S1 has a bed size of 235 by 235 millimeters, but only 220 by 220 is usable, and it can print models up to 270 millimeters tall. However, the printer I received needed some attention to be able to achieve that full height, which I'll get to shortly. So what comes in the box? As with many 3D printer manufacturers now, Creality are pushing a quick assembly feature with apparently up to 96% of the printer already pre-assembled. This means that there aren't many separate components in the box, and as usual, everything is packaged well. Once I had everything on the bench though, I realized quite quickly that I wasn't going to be able to simply follow the quick assembly guide supplied on the SD card. As with my Ender 3 version 2, the factory set tension on the bed rollers had not been set correctly. This time they were way too loose and I had a lot of play. Had I just bolted the printer together as per the instructions, then there's no way that I would have been able to produce good quality prints. Thankfully, this is just a quick adjustment for anyone that knows what they're doing, and I took the opportunity to detach the print bed and have a look at the underside, as it makes setting the bed roller tension easier. Once I'd set the tension and reattached the bed, the rest of the printer did go together pretty much as per the guide, but I did pay close attention to all the different roller tensions after losing confidence in Creality's assembly department early on. All of the rollers needed a little bit of adjustment, but nothing was as bad as the bed. The filament spool holder is nice. It includes a filament runout sensor and clips on very easily. You have to attach the Sprite direct drive extruder yourself, which is very easy to do with just a few small screws. All that's left to attach is the wiring harness. There are a few small plugs to connect around the printer, which is all very easy to do. I've always found the wiring on Creality printers to be pretty reliable on more recent models, but it often feels like a little bit of an afterthought and makes the printer look untidy. Other manufacturers, like Artillery, use very discreet ribbon cables that run alongside parts of the frame, which keep everything very tidy. My first impression of the S1 Pro's X carriage wiring was that it looked neat with good cable support at the extruder. However, when I came to plug everything in, I found that the small wires that have to run to the X axis extruder and X limit switch are too short, which means that there's constant strain on them. If I were to leave it like this, then I'd be concerned that the wiring could actually be damaged before too long. Just to prove that I was right to be concerned, when I tried to move the Z height to the printer's maximum of 270 millimeters, the X axis extruder plug actually pulled out. I spent a lot of time running wiring harnesses in a previous life, and as much as I like to leave these printers completely stock when reviewing, I just couldn't leave it like this. To start with, I wanted to see if there was any way to get a little more slack on the wiring, so I removed the base. This gave me the opportunity to have a look at the power supply and motherboard. The S1 is supplied with a 350 watt, 24 volt power supply, just like its recent Ender 3 brothers, and also a now expected 32 bit motherboard. So back to the wiring. I was only able to release a little bit more cabling from the base, and I still wasn't happy with the tension on the small wires. I decided that a DIY bracket was needed, so I designed and printed this piece to secure the flat cable at the rear of the stepper. It mounts off one of the roller bolts, and if you want to do the same on your printer, there's a link in the description below where you can download the file for free. With a new strain relief bracket fitted, the wiring is much more secure and actually folds nice and neatly down the side of the base. Of course, it also now allows the use of the full print height without damage or failed prints. Not quite the quick, easy setup the Creality advertised for the S1 Pro, but it could have been with just a little bit more attention to detail. Once I was able to turn the machine on, I got to try out the new touchscreen. This is an upgrade over the Ender 3 S1, which used the same screen as the Ender 3 version 2, and it's really nice. I have touchscreens on two of my other 3D printers, and honestly, they're more annoying to use than the simple twist and push knob on the Ender 3 version 2. This screen, however, is the first one I've used on a 3D printer that feels like it should be there. 
It also supports many different languages, which other 3D printers don't. There are no false triggers or missed touches. It's silky smooth and feels just like a smartphone. So what do you need to do before printing? Creality actually advise in this applied assembly video that there's no need to manually level your bed before running the auto level feature, but then also that if the bed is more than two millimeters out, that you'll need to run the manual level feature. To be honest, it's so quick and easy to manually level the bed first that you might as well. I'd had a comment on my auto bed leveling video where Niels D told me that they were unable to use the process on their S1 as there was a bug with the firmware. They pointed me to a couple of Reddit posts where others were detailing the same issue. The problem some have had is that something goes wrong with a bed mesh and they're getting very inconsistent results when trying to print. I of course wanted to see if this machine had the same problem so I deliberately adjusted the front of my bed down by a millimetre and created a new mesh and Z offset. Honestly, this just made zero difference on my machine and I couldn't recreate the problem. The first layers went down perfectly whether the bed was trammed or if it was a little out. I'm hoping that this now means that machines are shipping with a firmware fix, but as nobody was detailing the firmware they were having problems with, I can't say for sure. Another thing that makes me think they might have fixed it is that many are saying that trying to run auto leveling with a bed warm crashes the printer. Again, mine didn't do this, and unless I can actually get my hands on one that's misbehaving, I can only go by my own experience, which has actually been pretty faultless. I printed off some of the supplied files on the card, which were great, but what I was really excited to test was printing with filaments that I can't print on my other printers. I bought some nylon and polycarbonate and looked for something to slice in Cura. Unfortunately, when I came to add the printer in Cura, I found that there was no profile for the Ender 3 S1 Pro. This is not uncommon with a new model, and usually you can just use something similar and rename it. That's what I did with my Ender 3 version 2, but fundamentally, the version 2 is very similar to the other Ender 3 printers. However, the S1 Pro is quite a bit different with the direct drive and all metal hot end. Therefore, if I just used one of the other Ender 3 profiles and renamed it, I'm not going to get to use the full potential of the Ender 3 S1 Pro. What I did instead is install Creality's own slicer software, which is just a rebranded older version of Cura, so the interface is very similar. So similar, in fact, that it uses the same file types and profiles, and the profiles can be used in both slicers with a few tweaks. The benefit of using Creality's slicer to begin with is that they've included profiles for all of their machines, so it's much easier and quicker to get printing with correct profiles. The downside is that you don't get to take advantage of the new features that you'll get on an up-to-date version of Cura, which eventually you're going to want. So, exactly the same as with Cura, add a printer from the drop-down at the top, and then you can add your model before selecting material and nozzle size and slice. Surprisingly, the start G-code doesn't include a G29 or M420 code, which is needed for the printer to take its bed mesh into account. If you want to understand what I'm talking about, look for the link to the automatic bed levelling video in the description below. After adding the code, I rattled off the obligatory calibration cube and benchy and PLA to ensure everything was working, and then looked to print something using my new high temperature filaments. The Creality slicer has a nylon profile, but I think there must have been a typo on the retraction distance. It's set to 8mm, with a retraction speed of 25mm per second. With a direct drive extruder, it's very rare to want a retraction distance over 4mm, and higher retraction settings on an all-metal hot end can cause clogs. I tried dialing in the retraction myself using these little retraction tests, and found 0.8mm to be a decent setting to try, which seems to tally pretty closely with the supplied material guide. The print quality isn't stunning, but it's a lot better than I expected for a first print. The nylon seems to stay very soft after being extruded and didn't like the worst of the overhangs. There's also some stringing, but for my first print with nylon, I'm pretty happy. I also gave the polycarbonate a try. Whilst it definitely prints, I'm going to need to do a bit more testing to find a profile that fully utilises the potential of this material. Sticking with the Creality slicer, I tried printing with all the different filaments I have, and I didn't really have any problems with any of them. I tried PLA, PLA+, Silk PLA, Metallic PLA, PETG, TPU, ABS, and of course nylon and polycarbonate. Everything worked well, and I've been massively impressed by the consistency of the first layers. I put tape on the bed when printing with TPU, as it can stick a little too well to a PEI bed, but other than that I made no Z offset adjustments, and at no point did I reach for the glue stick. I don't know if it's just a PEI bed, or a combination of everything working together, but I've never used a 3D printer that I can trust this much to just press print and walk away. The printer heats up quicker than my version 2, which is probably due to the insulation on the underside of the bed, and we can see that the temperature spread is very good when viewed with a thermal camera. But as with pretty much any 3D printer, the actual bed temperature isn't quite what's displayed on the screen. The Ender 3 S1 Pro is also a little bit quieter than the Ender 3 version 2 as well. The cooling fan noise is a little louder than I'd like it to be, and also the power supply fan runs constantly whether the printer's printing or not. 
My artillery Sidewinder X2 is by far my quietest printer, but this is mainly due to the AC heated bed, which brings other problems that I'd rather avoid. The S1 Pro gets a nice LED gantry light, which is handy to see what you're doing, but it is just a light with a switch, so useful, but not groundbreaking. One issue I did have when trying all of the various different filaments was that using the filament change option in the menu is pretty pointless and actually gave me a clog when I first used it. Now, fixing a clog on a direct drive 3D printer with an all metal hot end is a bit more of a challenge than some of the simpler M3s. I did find a pretty simple method, which I'll create a video guide for, so hit subscribe if you don't want to miss out. I found that changing the filament manually was much easier, as long as you have the hot end hot enough and remember to push the filament in before pulling it out quite quickly you won't have any problems. On the subject of filament changes, I wanted to see if the S1 Pro could handle filament changes mid-print. I set up a filament change post-processing script within the slicer so that the printer would pause at a specific height and move away from the model. This part all worked fine, but there's no way to then restart the print. I managed to hack my way around it by turning off the power and some random screen presses, but it wasn't a process I'd want to use. Instead, I found the pause at height script to be much better as it has way more options. There were still a couple of slightly weird quirks to using it, but I found a consistent, repeatable method for reliable filament changes. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see a video of my method of changing the filament mid-print on the S1 Pro. I also tried out different nozzle sizes with no issues. The standard nozzle that you receive the printer looks a little different, but you can use any standard Mark 8 nozzle. I noticed no difference. I didn't even need to change the Z offset as they're the same length. With all new printers, I think it's very important to test thermal runaway. This was easy to do by just unplugging the heating element and trying to preheat the printer. Sure enough, before long, the printer threw a fault and stopped heating exactly as it should. I also like to test power loss recovery, which worked exactly as it should. So what else can I tell you about the Ender 3 S1 Pro? Whilst I've tested all of the headline features like the extruder, the PEI bed and the touchscreen, there are other features that make the experience of owning and using this printer better. The molded base cover gives the printer a more consumer ready feel. There are none of the rattles and thin panels of the Sidewinder, or the kit built feel of previous enders. This is a very neat solid machine that I think looks great. It has a wider tool drawer which is handy and the smooth uncluttered surfaces make it easy to keep clean. In fact the design of this machine is so well thought about, except for the wiring strain relief, that those of you that like modifying your printers are going to be hard pressed to find places to add colour coded printed parts. The flexible bed wiring also seems to have been improved further with a bespoke design that looks like it will stand up well to a bit of abuse but only time will tell. As with other Creality machines, connecting with Octoprint is a breeze. Although the USB port is now USB-C, so you may need a different cable if you want to connect. So, pros and cons. I'll do the negatives first because, honestly, it's not a very long list. Firstly, in my opinion, the biggest negative of the Ender 3 S1 Pro is the lack of attention paid to the assembly of the pre-assembled parts. When you're telling owners that they don't even need to manually level their bed before creating a mesh, you'd better be sure that everything has been done correctly up to that point. Unfortunately, this does appear to be a common problem with Creality printers. If only someone had just spent a couple more minutes making sure that that wiring was long enough or that the bed rollers were adjusted properly, my experience with this printer would have been incredible. Take note, Creality, as this is not a difficult problem to fix. Another minor niggle for me is I generally like to see a live Z height on the screen whilst the print's in progress. And it would also be good if the pause print feature wasn't so confusing. It does just seem that a few minor details have been overlooked and that the firmware just needs a little bit more attention. Also, I always like to keep the printers as standard as possible whilst testing, but it's been quite obvious that the hot end PID settings are not quite right. The temperature overshoots and takes a long time to settle. This is an easy fix with a PID tune, which I made a video guide for. Check out the link in the description if you need it. So what about the positives? Well, there are many for the Ender 3 S1 Pro. It looks great, it prints well, and it gives you more print material options than ever before. The PEI bed is awesome, and honestly, I don't want to use anything else anymore. I've already bought one for my Artillery Sidewinder X2, and I plan on adding them to all my machines when I can. The gantry light is handy, and will be even more useful once I sort out control via Octoprint in the future. The Sprite extruder and the all-metal hot end appear to be of a very high quality, and there are a lot of other little design touches that I really like. All in all, in my opinion, the Ender 3 S1 Pro is a fantastic 3D printer and is only really let down by a lack of attention on the pre-assembled parts. If you're confident to check these things yourself, then this could be the perfect 3D printer for you. If, however, you're completely new to 3D printing, then a little bit of fiddling to set everything up at the beginning could be overwhelming. So is the Ender 3 S1 the best Ender 3 money can buy? Possibly, yes. It certainly has the best spec and it uses it well, but Creality have also released the Ender 3 S1 Plus. 
This is a very similar printer, but has a build volume of 300 by 300 by 300. The only thing it lacks is the all metal hot end and the gantry light. The bigger build volume also comes at a higher price though, so you need to know that you're gonna need the extra room. The S1 Plus is generally around $50 more than the S1 Pro, and with the geek buying discount, it makes the difference about $100, which for me is just a bit too much. If you want to be able to print with the largest variety of materials, have the best bed adhesion, and have a printer that can genuinely sit on a desk, then I don't believe that there's a better printer in this price bracket than the Ender 3 S1 Pro. If the assembly had been a little better, then I'd say that it's hands down the best 3D printer I've used, and would also be a great beginner printer. As it is though, I can't help but feeling it just falls a little bit short. If you'd like to see one of my other 3D printer reviews, then click one of these videos here, or click here for another video you might like. Thanks for watching.